Great. All right. Welcome back. We are in the home stretch. How did everyone enjoy your afternoon? All right. Who, who made the top leaderboard spot? Five, really? Oh, well done. Well done. Well done. All right. Well, I hope you had fun. That lunch was good. The interactive expo was good. And your breakout sessions, how were the breakouts? Yep, okay, we tried to mix it up a bit and gave a variety. So, all right, well in this last track, uh, we're gonna have some of our core platform team members come up and share their latest progress. Uh, they'll come up one after the other, so it'll be a bit fast paced, so let's carry on. So when our first uh, set of speakers aren't running through random forests and climbing decision trees, you can catch them mentoring a number of our interns on Nave Bayes, logistic regression, linear regression, agglomerate of hierarchical, PB blasts, and many other algorithms that I don't understand. <laughs> but uh, let's welcome Roger Dev and Lily Zhu to tell us all about what's new in our machine learning libraries. Hi, everybody. It's good to see you all here today. It's good to see a lot of people I've seen at previous conferences, and uh, it's good to see some new people, too. Uh, so I've got some bad news and some good news. So I'm not going to be able to uh, get into uh, deep into the algorithms like we usually do. Uh, I like to really get to the bottom of the algorithms so everybody can understand what's going on but I'm not gonna be able to do that today. Um, question, is, is that the bad news or the good news? Yes. <laughs> so, no, the good news is we have so many, uh, uh, so much new stuff going into the machine learning library that uh, I, uh, we can't do a deep dive into all of it, so we're just gonna uh, kind of tease it and uh, do it at a uh, surface level, show you what's going on, maybe tickle your uh, appetite and we have uh, other resources, blogs, and papers and such. If you uh, want to get deeper into it, uh, we have enough information to let you get as deep as you want. So uh, one of the reasons we have so much new going on is because uh, of Lily. Lily has uh, uh, been contributing to the machine learning library and uh, has done a lot of, a lot of uh, good work there. So uh, she's on Arjuna's team, and uh, it's really good to have her helping out. So the theme for this year is to uh, expand the machine learning library to handle multimedia and unsupervised learning. Each year, we decide what we want to add to it, what are the most important salient features to add to the library, and uh, this year, uh, it, it was uh, those. So by uh, multimedia, I'm talking about handling uh, uh, images, videos, time series, those sorts of things. And we'll get a little bit into more about what we mean by unsupervised learning. Uh, we've also got an extended set of model evaluation metrics. These are how you determine whether the model that you trained is good or bad, uh, and how you compare two models. Uh, we've got a module called text vectors that uh, Farah talked a little bit about earlier uh, that is uh, machine learning for textual data, freeform text. So if in your data set you have some text that's entered by hand, uh, we can now utilize that within the machine learning. Uh, we have a generalized neural network package. That's a deep learning for image, video, time series, et cetera. And then we've got two different clustering protocols that Lily's going to talk about, k-means and dbscan. So first I'm going to review what the current library looks like uh, so you can see, understand the additions. Uh, so we start out with the uh, base uh, bundles, which are um, ML core, the core machine learning uh, capabilities and PBBLAST, which is our parallel uh, linear algebra system, handling matrices at scale. And then we've got a bunch of supervised learning methods. Uh, and we'll get into the difference uh, a little bit later. 
Uh, we've got linear regression, logistic regression, learning trees, which are all the tree-based learning methods, uh, general linear model, uh, variations on uh, uh, linear logistic regression for different uh, types of distributions, and support vector machines. So we have a pretty, pretty rich set of supervised learning techniques. Uh, now we're adding to that uh, three unsupervised techniques, text vectors, k-means, and dbscan, and also a deep learning uh, package, uh, GNN, gen uh, Generalized Neural Networks. So let's uh, quickly uh, talk about supervised versus unsupervised learning. So in supervised learning, you've got a set of input data, and you've got a set of annotations or labels. Uh, so you can say, this is, these are apples, these are oranges, these are peaches, and show it a bunch of apples, oranges, and peaches, and it learns to recognize an orange, an apple, and a peach when it sees them. Uh, and that's based on previous knowledge, or what we call ground truth. The ground truth is that this is a picture of an apple, that's a picture of an orange. With unsupervised learning, you don't tell the algorithm what anything is. You just say, here's a bunch of data. Figure out how to organize it. Figure out how to spot patterns in it. Uh, and it will typically sort out the apples from the oranges and the bananas by looking for things that are similar or looking for trends within the data itself. All right, so I'm going to start to talk about the, the changes. And I'm going to start with the extended evaluation metrics. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. Uh, if you have questions, we've got lots of backup uh, information on it. Uh, so these are extensions to the ML core module uh, to better evaluate your machine learning models or compare alternative models. Uh, this is done by uh, one of our interns uh, named Surya uh, from India. So it, in ML Core, there's a module called Accuracy, and this is what you use to assess the accuracy of your model. One part of that is regression accuracy, and we've got a whole bunch of uh, metrics for understanding the accuracy of your regressions. Uh, standard error, ANOVA, confidence intervals, uh, a Kaike information criteria, et cetera. Uh, I won't go into any of these in detail, but you can read about them. They're in the documentation. Uh, we've also got a module for classification accuracy. And we have a number of uh, ways of looking at the accuracy of a classification. It's a little complicated because if, if you have three different classes that you're uh, classifying to, uh, you may be doing really well at one class, really bad at another class. Uh, you might have a problem distinguishing two classes. Uh, so there are a lot of different, uh, different ways to understand it. Uh, one of them is uh, called precision recall. And um, precision recall and false positive rate, if you look at those for each class, you can kind of understand what's going on a little bit better. But if you're trying to compare things, it's hard to compare things with three different parameters. So a balanced F score combines precision and recall into a single score. Um, Another one is Hamming loss and area under the curve. I don't exactly understand how either of these work, uh, so I'll uh, refer you to the documentation on that. And finally, we've added uh, some uh, metrics for clustering accuracy. One's called the silhouette coefficient, and the ad adjusted RAND index is the other. So as we, as we add different types of uh, machine learning, we want to make sure that uh, we give you the tools to assess those models that you build. Also, uh, Surya added a feature selection uh, module. We've had a few uh, people requesting this. Uh, it uses the chi-squared feature selection test. This lets you determine which of your features are the most important in discriminating your classes or your regression output. Uh, we've got um, details here. Uh, the module documentation itself uh, is very rich. It not only explains what the parameters are, but it gives you a background into what, they, what they're useful for. And uh, Surya uh, published a research publication, uh, Design and Implementation of Machine Learning Evaluation Metrics on HPCC, a very good paper that uh, describes all his new work in detail. 
Next, we're going to talk about text vectors. Uh, you got a little bit of exposure to that with Farah's presentation. And uh, essentially, if you have freeform text and you want to do something analytical with it, this gives you the capability of doing it. I'm going to go through a little introduction to this. It's a fully unsupervised learning. You give it a corpus, which is a body of text, such as all of Wikipedia is an example of a corpus. And it will automatically learn on its own uh, which words are related, which sentences are related, and it will, um, it, it will start to understand the essence of what the uh, text means. Uh, it's kind of surprising, but I'll get a little bit more into that. Uh, basically, you use it to convert freeform text into numeric vectors, uh, and we support both word vectors and sentence vectors. So you can compare two words, you can compare two sentences and see if they're similar or dissimilar. A vector is an ordered list of numbers. Uh, we think of it as a coordinate in n-dimensional space. So two numbers give you a two-dimensional vector, uh, three numbers give you a three-dimensional vector, and n numbers gives you an n-dimensional vector. And typically we use between 20 and 1,000 dimensions for those vectors. Uh, 100 is most common. Uh, so vectors that are close in space are also close in meaning. So essentially you're turning text into numbers, but not just arbitrary numbers, numbers where their position in space relative to one another uh, actually implies the meaning of that text. So let's, I've got a couple slides on the theory here. Uh, in 1957, the linguist John Rupert Firth uh, said, you shall know a word by the company it keeps. Interesting. If we look at that a little more rigorously, uh, we say the meaning of a word is closely associated with the distribution of the words that, sound it, that surround it in coherent text. So how does this unsupervised wor learning work? It actually looks at the distribution of words that are around other words. And based on those distributions, if two words have similar distributions of other words around them, then they must mean very similar things. Uh, and believe it or not, it works. So you start out with all of your words, 60,000 words, however many you have in your documents, in random positions. And as it trains itself, based on the distribution of the words, it starts to organize them into similarities. So cat and dog become very close together, where piston is way out in left field. Uh, if you have canine and uh, feline, those will be very close to their counterparts. Uh, it really learns how to categorize the words and sentences by their closeness and meaning. So applications for this uh, analysis of text, you can turn this text into these vectors. And once you've got the vectors, those can be features for any machine learning algorithm. So if you want to do a classification or a regression on that text, you can now use those uh, vector numbers as input to that algorithm. So you can classify it. You can find a uh, closest sentence to a new sentence. You can do sentiment analysis, say, is this a positive sentence, a negative sentence, et cetera. Uh, it's used in freeform search in a lot of places. Uh, for uh, if, if I search for a uh, car, it'll find an article on automobile because it knows that those two words mean the same. Used in, in translation, uh, mining of textual information, and a lot of uh, other uses are, potent are possible. Uh, we, I think we're really just starting to peel back the cover on the types of things we can do with these, with these technologies. Uh, there's a uh, theory and tutorial uh, doc, uh, blog article uh, there's a link to it here, uh, machine learning for textual data. That goes into the uh, theory, into the uh, case study, and a, then a tutorial on how to use the bundle. OK, the next uh, bundle is the generalized neural networks. Not quite released yet, but it will be coming out this year. 
And this is a flexible interface to Keras and TensorFlow. Uh, Google's TensorFlow is the most widely used deep learning framework. And Keras is a high-level interface to TensorFlow, and as well as other frameworks. And it's the most widely used deep learning interface. Uh, it's included as a standard component of TensorFlow. So we chose to do this so that we could take advantage of things like Robbie has, uh, Kennedy was talking about, uh, using GPUs uh, that's all built into TensorFlow and Keras, uh, so that uh, if you run a cluster with a GPU on every node, you should be able to uh, train much faster. Uh, it also was highly supported and uh, a lot of new development in that area. Very, very broad system. So what we do is we create a version of TensorFlow on each of the HPCC cluster nodes. And then we train each, uh, we train each node on a different set of the data, a different subset of, of your data. Periodically, we then take all the learned weights from all of the different nodes, and we recombine them and send them back out to the nodes, and it continues training. So every so often, we synchronize the weights so that you continue to learn uh, across the various nodes. Uh, we provide full access to the Keras sequential model capabilities. Uh, Keras has a, different, a couple, two different types of models. Uh, one is a sequential model, and I think the other is called the uh, procedural model. Uh, you can do all of the well-known uh, neural network types using the sequential model. It doesn't restrict you very much, uh, but if you get into some of the brand new uh, things, you may need to use the procedural model, and that will be uh, planned to support in future release can handle any style of neural network, your classical neural networks, uh, convolutional neural networks. And convolutional networks are used for, uh, typically for processing images. Uh, you can have a cat in your image somewhere, and it does, in a convolutional network, it doesn't matter where in the picture that cat sits, it will see the cat in any position within the image. Recurrent networks uh, are supported. Uh, those are things like a, a long short-term memory uh, or LSTM networks. And those are typically used for time series and video. Uh, so these capabilities allow you to really handle any type of data, um, much, much more complex data than you can handle with your traditional machine learning. Uh, also allows you to support things like autoencoders, which are unsupervised training of weight vectors. The text vectors is a really good example of that. Text vectors, uh, you, you give it the words and the other words that are with it, and it learns the weights that, uh, that make the words such that close words and meaning are close together in space. Uh, when you treat the weights, from that model, those weights are your actual word vectors. So uh, it's a kind of an indirect approach for unsupervised training, uh, where you're looking for the weights, not for the actual predictions. Uh, it includes a uh, tensor model in ECL uh, that allows you to define, create, manage uh, n-dimensional data sets within ECL directly. Let's talk a little bit about tensors. Think of tensors as n-dimensional arrays or matrices. A single number, a scalar, is a zero-dimensional tensor. A vector is a one-dimensional tensor. A matrix is a two-dimensional te tensor. And in many cases, you need a lot more than two dimensions for some of the deep, the deep learning. For traditional machine learning, two-dimensional works really well. You have your observations, and you have your features. So for each, uh, uh, each automobile, you have a set of features associated with that automobile. But when you go into multimedia data, more dimensions are required. For instance, for color images, you've got the number of observations times the pixel width times the pixel height 
times three for red, green, and blue. Uh, so that's a four-dimensional. For video, you have your number of observa observations times the pixel width times the pixel height times three times the number of frames in your video. So that's a, a five-dimensional uh, tensor that you use as input to that. Uh, so the tensor module allows you to create these five, four, three, four, five-dimensional uh, data sets and pass them in and out of the GNN module. Uh, it, uh, the GNN module uh, packs these, this tensor data into, um, into structures called slices that can be moved around easily through the system uh, and handles all of the distribution and synchronization of these tensors uh, in the system across the cluster. Second major component of GNN is uh, called the GNNI or GNN interface. Uh, this is an easy-to-use easy interface for defining, training, and utilizing neural networks. Uh, handles all the parallelization and distribution of data transparently. Under the hood, uh, as we talked about, a separate TensorFlow network is trained on each node, and the results are combined periodically. And it supports everything that Keras and TensorFlow support. So there are hundreds of classes uh, that you can create, all different types of layers within TensorFlow, and it allows you to use any of those uh, layers. Uh, in e in uh, native Keras, which is Python, uh, you create a se sequential model and you add layers one at a time. In ECL, you just create a list of layers and call define model with that list. Turns out that the code for that list is the same as your code for the layer add in uh, Keras. So you really uh, can cut your code right out of, uh, uh, out of Python and uh, drop it in, uh, and it will define the model for you. Uh, input to training and prediction are via tensors, and tensors are also used to get and set weights. Uh, so we talked about uh, non-sequential models, uh, more complex hybrid deep learning techniques. Uh, support for textual data. Right now, the tensors are only numeric, uh, real numbers. Uh, we don't support uh, string tensors uh, or uh, uh, integer tensors right now. It's all real numbers. Uh, so we need to support a few more data types there. And uh, some of the new, more complex uh, neural networks, such as generative adversarial networks, which is one of the uh, hot new things in neural networks, uh, we want to be able to support that, and that requires uh, supporting multiple uh, neural networks at the same time and feeding one into the other. So it's a little bit more complicated, but it's something we'd like to be able to support in the next version. All kinds of applications, uh, scoring, classification of images, video, or time series. Uh, multivariate optimization, like autoencoders and vectorization, and uh, lots of others that we haven't even imagined yet. Uh, so this bundle will be releasing soon, and we'll be uh, producing blog article tutorial on how to use it. Uh, so I look for that coming out shortly. And now I'm going to turn it over to Lily, who's going to discuss clustering methods. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Um, so now I'm going to introduce uh, one more advancement for our machine learning library. It's called clustering methods. I'm going to mainly focus two methods, k-means and db-scan. So first of all, they both are unsupervised machine learning. As Roger introduced, they don't need any previous knowledge. For example, we have a basket of apple and a banana. And then we're running clustering methods on the data, the baskets. And it will tell us there are two groups of, of uh, fruits in the basket. So that's how um, clustering work, uh, works. I don't need a previous knowledge and automatically tell you the results. That's the clusters of the data. And the last, the implementation in our library is highly scalable and parallelized. 
is designed especially for big data challenge. There are many applications around uh, clustering methods. The first one we can see here is clustering the clean data. For example, we have claims coming in, a large volume, and we don't need to one by one checking on, okay, what cl uh, the customer is. We can just run clustering methods and then segment the, uh, the customers who submit the claims and tell the, the, maybe the marketing team there are three groups of uh, customers, high risk ones, medium risk ones, and low risk ones. And also, clustering can be used for image segmentation. In this picture, we're just using clustering, cluster the similar pixels. So we can see different sections of uh, um, areas in this picture, like the river bands, the mountains, and the sky. And similar, use same technique. We can clustering the pixels in a car picture, and then we can segmenting the uh, driver license from the car. And the last application I want to introduce is the famous experiments conducted on 1998. We're using clustering methods to clustering the gene expressions, find the similar genetic information, find the diseases cause certain um, disasters in human being genes. So the clustering methods have so many applications, but the two widely used methods are k-means and dbscan. There are both clustering methods. Why are we implementing those similar things? Because they are similar, but they are also different. So first, see um, k-means. So k-means is one of the most popular clustering methods, mainly because it's simplicity and it's wide applications. And also, k-means uh, in our system in HPCC is highly scalable and parallelized. So here's one example for k-means. It's um, moving action for k-means to, uh, to actively iterating the data and then find the final clusters in the data. Because of this, uh, the parametric feature of k-means, such as we have to, to, to tell the model we need three clusters in the data. And we, we need to define the tolerance, how the cluster is going to converge as a final result. So that means in this motion, k-means have to move in um, exactly at 3k in this example as the user defines, and converge strictly as the tolerance as zero, which means the center won't move anymore. Then we define that are the final clusters. And also k-means, because of this parametric feature, it's sensitive to this parameter initialization, which means the user can define different k's for same data, and the results can be totally different. So that's one very sensitive feature for k-means. The last, the one feature um, that very interesting is k-means have very similar shape and a size for every cluster. They all have the spherical shapes and have similar size in each cluster. That means when you're clustering some data, you have the pre-knowledge that the data most probably gonna be have similar shape and similar size. So because of this, um, the, the parametric of k-means, we also know that k-means is sensitive to the outliers, which means there's outliers, k-mean won't really tell those are outliers. Instead, if you're clustering the, the, the outliers into the cluster as final, re, final results, that means the outliers are gonna be undistinguishable in k-means clustering methods. And the last, so when we have high dimensional data, the high dimensional means the data is very sparse. In a sparse space, we know the data are very far away from each other. That's mean, that means that it's hardly can cluster in the same scope. So which we call it a, the curse of a dimensionality. So based on this feature, let, let's see uh, dbscan. So dbscan is a clustering methods, but it, it's density-based. So density-based means 
Okay, so deep scan similar to K-Needs is a highly scalable and parallelized in HPCC systems. Um, but because it's a density based, it's a different methods, we use two different parameters. It's a minimum distance and then the minimum of points to uh, combine together, become the smallest uh, cluster to gradually, as you can see in the example, from the initial cluster, moving around the density cluster and combine all of them together into the final cluster. And the clusters can, because of the parameters, be different. For example, in this example, we perfectly define the epsilon B100 and the mean points B4, and the result looks perfect. But what if I change the minimum number B100? Uh, then the scope of the cluster is going to be very large. As we can imagine, the result is going to be a very different shape because of the parameters. And here we see we have almost like three or four clusters, but once the uh, parameter become larger, the number is going to become smaller. And also, same to um, K-means, DBScan DB is uh, sensitive to the parameter definitions. But DBScan has one um, good, the good stuff is it can cluster any shape of uh, clusters. It's a wrong shape, it's a um, um, curling shape, it doesn't really matter. And one good stuff about DeepScan is that DeepScan can automatically detect outliers. As we see K-means, K-means uh, kind of uh, uh, don't know what outlier, what really should be in the cluster. But DeepScan knows what exactly the outlier is. So I will automatically tell you the outliers. And because of this, the density-based methods, DBSCAN is by nature very sensitive to the density variance. Um, as we discussed before, if I change the minimum points or epsilon, the clustering result is going to become different number of uh, clusters. And similar to K-means, DBSCAN also have the curse of uh, dimensionality. Speak all this is kind of confusing, K-means and DBSCAN, but here, we have one more sample here telling you the difference. So first comparison is the cluster shapes. You can see K-means on the left-hand side, the space being cut into exactly the same shape, and they're all in a spherical um, scope. But in DBSCAN, it's density-based methods. So the cluster don't really matter what shape or size. And you continually, based on the density of, of the neighbors, and the clustering until the density being broken up. And the cluster size, as I said, they are all um, different. So K means most probably they're going to have a similar size. But deep scan have a really random shape and a random size because of the methods difference. But both are uh, parametric. They have their own par parameters. Um, the different definition of the model going to define two different results. So that's the sensitivity of the two models. And one important difference for K-means and deep scan is K-means have fixed number of cluster. At the start, we define the model. So if I say I want the I want to say k-means can run a three cluster on the same data, then the result is going to be exactly three cluster. But for DB scan, I don't have to. It automatically clustering all the similar density clusters and telling the user, here's the results, how many cluster is there. And for k-means, k-means don't have outlier detection function, but deep scan have the um, outlier detection functionality. But in similar, in similar uh, manner, both k-means and deep scan have the curse of dimensionality. So when the space becomes sparse, both k-means and deep scan won't be really a good choice for clustering. Because the difference of K-means and DeepScan, the application for them are a little bit different. 
for this example, we have clustering methods for the spatial da geospatial data and demographic data. So for example, we wanted to say, okay, what's the crime area in this, in this city? Then most probably the domain experts are gonna use in DBSCAN because the demographic data is based on the density of the population, like who conduct crimes. So that makes more sense. We're gonna use in DBSCAN in this case. And for recommendation systems, we normally can, based on the like case by case, maybe k-means can work or dbscan also works. So one example is we watch Netflix and it will say, okay, this user, based on the clustering methods, he watched these kind of uh, movies. So it can re uh, recommend you next movie when you turn on Netflix next time. So speak all these theories about k-means and deep scan, about clusterings, then how about the k-means and deep scan in HPC systems in reality? It's easy to use. We implemented the k-means and deep scan in a very simple steps. We only have three, uh, two steps. The first step is import the bundle in your system, so it's one line code. And step two is train your model based on the parameters we just discussed. That's two steps only. Import the bundle and train it. That's it. And step three, if you want to, you can optionally predict in the new data. So I build a model based on the clustering methods, and when I have new data came in, I want to know which cluster the new data belong to. So in this case, I can use prediction function, predicting the labels or cluster index of, of the new data. And the last step is also optional, is to uh, realize your clustering, clustering results because in clustering, it, it's unsupervised. We don't know the ground truth of the labels. In this case, usually, we wanted to see what's the final results of the clusters in the data. I use the cloud ID, uh, ECL Cloud IDE to realize the results of k-means. In this case, we have three clustering uh, groups as results. So if you want more details for clustering methods in our system, the tutorials, you can go online. It's called Automatically Clustering Your Data with Massively Scalable K-Means. We also have research publications on this. Um, it's called Massively Scalable Parallel K-Means on HPCC Systems Platform. And uh, with, the, with this opportunity, I thank you for my co-authors, Dr. Amy A. Pong, Dr. Flavio, Roger Dev and Arjuna Chala. So there are some links for references if you want more uh, information for, for, for this. If any questions or you want to do some applications with us, contact us. Here, here's uh, the contacts for Roger and me. And that's pretty much it. Thank you. Thank you. Too many choices. Now we all awake. Thank you, Roger, for that. <laughs> Very interesting. Um, this talk is going to be um, about the H3 um, geohashing library plugin that's part of the version 7 release of the platform. Um, it's a plugin, so it's actually part of the platform. Um, as opposed to a bundle, it's not something you need to download and install after the fact. Um, I'm only mentioning it now because I forgot to put a slide on it. Okay, so what is a geohash? Um, a geohash is basically a, a combination of a lat latitude and longitude values combined into a single value via some function. Um, it's useful for spatial indexing your, your data sets that have lat and longs. Um, and when it's stored as a single value, it means it can be held as a single field. It can be indexed in traditional database environments. 
there are many different types of representations. Um, there's the original GeoHash. Um, Google has their own geohashing one. There's a bunch of them. But the, the one we're looking at is, is the H3 implementation by Uber, which um, we'll be looking at now, the, the API of it in, in a couple of slides. Hierarchical geohashes are of particular interest um, because they allow us to specify various resolutions um, for our locations, which allow us to aggregate and, and put our locations into buckets. So depending what we want to do, it lets us take a, a, a high-level overview and get grouped aggregates, or it will let us deep dive in and find specific points within specific areas. Um, the, the one we'll be looking at today is, is a hexagon-based one, um, but the square ones and triangular ones, as you can see, also exist. As I say, it's a hexagon-based, Uber's H3. Um, it, they the nice thing about the hexagons is they approximate to circles. Um, they only have six neighbors, whereas triangular-based ones have 12 neighbors, and square rectangular-based um, geohashes would have eight neighbors. Um, the other nice feature is that with a hexagon-based one is that all the neighbors tend to be equal, equal distance away, which is good for um, migration-type calculations. Um, as well as the, the geohash indexing, there's a bunch of other functions within the, um, the Uber library. Um, some of the interesting features it are, they include a support for regions. Um, what we mean by regions is arbitrary polygon shapes. So we can send into their, into their library an a arbitrary shape, and it will give us, return a set of indexes that represent all the geohashes at a given resolution within that region. They've got great language support, now including ECL. Um, and we're going, to just, we're going to dig a bit more into it now. So what does the world look like um, when, you're, when you're looking at H3G geohashes? At the very top level, um, we have about 121 regions on the world. But as we zoom in, um, we'll see that the, the, um, the resolutions get more, that's playing on, the video's playing on the wrong screen. It's on the secondary monitor up here. There we go, okay. So basically this, this video was simply um, illustrating that as you zoom in on Google Maps, the fidelity of each of these geohashes regions um, get finer and finer, um, right into the corner of an office. Um, and we'll be talking about the sizes of those in a minute. Um, this is what the, the wrapped API looks like within ECL. Um, I've tried to highlight some of the functions that I'm using in the demos today. Um, but they're, the, the API pretty much matches exactly what the H3 API is. So if we go, if we go to their link, um, and their documentation, you'll, you'll find out what each function is doing explicitly. But they're, they're broken into five or six different sections. Indexing takes a latitude, a longitude, and a given resolution from 0 to 15, so the 16 different fidelity levels, resolution levels, and will return you a single H3 index representation. Um, there's two more methods in there. One will give you the center point for that geohash, and the second one will give you the boundary um, for that specific geohash. There's some um, introspection functions. Um, they will tell you for any given H3 index, they will tell you uh, what resolution it's at. Um, it's got some functions in there to convert it to a string, back out of a string. Um, we've got some traversal functions, which essentially tells you for any given geohash what the neighbors are and what the neighbors' neighbors are. So you can find the boundaries and, and locality for a given H3 index. We've got the hierarchical ones, which are particularly interesting. So for any H3 index, we can ask for any of its parentage at a lower resolution. Or for any H3 index, we can say, give me a list of all the children of this particular um, H3 index for this higher resolution further down. The regions, um, there's this polyfill function where you pass in a data set of points, and that's out, an outline of an arbitrary shape, 
And what it will, will return you at a given resolution is a set of H3 indexes that um, will cover that area. Um, there's also um, the capability to compact that set of indexes. So we will reduce it to a smaller set, but we will include bigger um, geo hashes um, within that set to cover the same area. Um, and that will help optimize our joins later on. Then finally, at the bottom there, we've got some ECL optimized functions. Um, the ECL index um, is a string 16, um, and it's a friendlier representation of a high-res um, geo hash. Um, and it works particularly well with our, with our indexes and our joins. And there's a bunch of functions there going to and from a H3 index to an ECL index, um, as well as um, finding a parentage and the resolution. This is what the, for the bit twiddlers out there, this is what a H3 index actually looks like. It's represented as a single integer 64. Um, and at the tail end of it, it it's got three bits per resolution. Um, but unfortunately, it prefixes some additional information in there, some re reserved bytes, and it prefixes the resolution on each H3 index, which, which kind of, it's, it's akin to being a P string, which would be a, um, a length prefixed string. It makes it rather difficult to index off. So this is why we have our, our ECL index, which is a, as I said, is a string 16 representation. As we go up the resolutions, or go down the resolutions, um, it's simply a matter of, of trimming a character off the end. And as we do that, we, we lose some fidelity, um, and the, the hexagons will, will start to get bigger. So here I am, I'm simply zooming out, and each time I zoom out and lower the resolution, I'm simply taking a single character off the end of the, the ECL index, and thus making the, the bucket um, that the location was in um, larger. And you can see the sizes go from under a square meter right up to 4.2 square kilometers. Um, I mentioned the regions and the polygons. Why they're useful is for an arbitrary region, um, and this is my attempt to, to draw an outline around the state. Um, for, I'm just building up an arbitrary region here, and I'm going to call the H3 polyfill at a rather low resolution, which is why it's quite granular. And I'm going to do that for just a couple of funny shapes, like a triangle and uh, an hourglass, because that will remind me to hurry up. Um, now, I've asked for this at, at a reasonably low resolution, which is why the, the fidelity isn't great around the edges. But if I run it through the compact um, function, you can see it's maintained some of the larger hexagons um, while introducing smaller ones around the boundary. And I could have upped the resolution if, if that wasn't, um, wasn't high enough for, for my purpose. So what does this look like in ECL? Well, first of all, importing it, it's just import lib under bar h3. Uh, as I said earlier, there's no bundles to install. It's just part of the platform. Um, the first thing we would do is we would take whatever data set we have with our latitude and longitude columns, and we would index it. So this is your, your standard ECL indexing um, pattern, um, where we have ECL index is h3. Dot, and we're going to use the ECL index, passing in lat and long, and we're passing in 15 as being the, most, the highest resolution that we have. The next thing we might want to do is take an arbitrary region um, and create a optimized data set of ECL indexes for that region. Um, to do that, we, we pass in the polygon of lat longs, so whatever shape you like. Um, we call the H3 polyfill on that at a given resolution. So depending how big your shape is and, and what sort of fidelity you want, you'll pick a, a suitable resolution. We then compact it, so that will reduce the number of um, polygons while maintaining the, the, the overall shape that we've put in there. And that's created a H3 index set. We then convert that to an ECL index set by just projecting it through a table there, which now means for any arbitrary polygon shape, we have a list of, of ECL indexes. And if we want to get all the points that live with inside that shape, um, we simply do a, a join of that ECL index set to our indexed file. And the join condition is going to be, the left-hand side is the ECL index from the region. And the right-hand side is going to be the ECL index from the index, but we're going to just do a, a, 
substring on it so that the length of the, that ECL index matches the length of the, the lower resolution one from the ECL index set. It's equivalent to finding all, everybody with the last name Smith by just filtering on SMI and finding everybody whose name is SMI. Starts with SMI. What that looks like if we were to publish that to Roxy and stick a visualization in front of it. Um, now, this data set is supposed to be every address in Canada. So we're just zooming into a, a, into a neighborhood, and we're going to just draw a rectangle or a, a polygon around there. And as soon as it finished drawing, it made the Roxy call and pulled out all the pins for that particular region. Um, we'll go off to a, a similar neighborhood, and we'll draw a, a similar arbitrary shape. Um, this one here, I didn't do a particularly good job, and I missed a few houses, so we'll just alter that shape and make the new Roxy, Roxy call. So making, getting all the pins in the region is a really, really quick exercise now with the, with the join. Let's have a look at some more ECL. Um, in this case, what we might want to do is, again, we're going to do it for all the addresses in Canada, but we, we might want to do some pre-aggregated summary information. So what we're going to do is we're going to basically do grouped aggregate counts of every pin at every resolution level, um, which is 16 levels. So we write a, a function to do that using table and count group. Um, we, again, we're using the fact that we can do a substring on ECL index to the resolution we want um, to, to do the grouped aggregate at that size. We then just concat concatenate together all those data sets and we have another index. We build that index and we now have got a summary index. So again, if we publish that to a Roxy service, um, we can now zoom in, and again, using some of our new visualizations from the, the framework, what we're looking at here is address density, um, again, in Canada, and we're zooming in, in around the Toronto area. And we'll eventually get down there. Now, each time we zoom in, and each time we, we move the screen a bit, we're making a new Roxy call, to the visible region that the, the user is looking at. So here we can see we've, kind of, we've gotten down to one, to one geo hash per property, where the, the taller hexagons are, or probably apartment blocks, where there's a high density of addresses in those locations. So again, you can see as I move it, it's making new Roxy calls. But again, because the region is being optimized down and it's a straight join, um, it's quite a quick exercise. So finally, um, for the final demo, what I did is I took those two indexes that I created, I've wrapped them up inside an ECL macro um, with a few little tricks. So the idea of this macro is you can give it a, a logical file name um, and then give it the field name for latitude and longitude, and that's all the information you need to provide. So what we're going to be doing here is we're going to be creating a visualization for any data set um, that happens to have Latin long information. So the first thing, we, we, we run the H3 helper, which, which creates the badly named cities attribute. It should be um, addresses. Um, so the first thing we do is we go um, cities.buildall index, and we submit that to Thor. So that's going to build our two indexes for us. Um, and then we, we would uh, compile and publish the H3 query um, to Roxy. So with that macro, um, we also, in this URL, we have also got a manifest which tells it when we we gather the archive for that work unit to also include um, some visualization information. And when that's all put together and submitted um, and published to there, if we go to the published query on Roxy and go to its details page, if you click on um, the resources tab, you'll see that you've now got an interactive map of your data set where you can keep zooming in. Now, while the numbers are very high, um, we will just stick to the summary information and we'll display them in their geohash hexagons. But at a certain point, we'll get down to a boundary where the, um, where the number of points we, can, we will be able to handle comfortably within the front end. And we simply just download all those pins to the front end as we scroll around. Um, the, the clustering that you see here is done on the client side just to make it easier for people to navigate. So we'll zoom in. We see two buildings there with two addresses, so there'd be some sort of duplexes. And again, as we zoom out, um, we'll, we'll see at, at a certain point we're going to hit a threshold where we can't handle that number of pins in the client, so we just do the grouped aggregates. 
And that's a quick overview of the new H3 plugin, which is part of the version 7 platform. Some useful links. And that's it. <laughs> Hello everyone, welcome. So, uh, my speech won't be so nice, so be scientific as before, but I believe it's equally important. So, release on schedule approach in HPCC platform team. The outline is demand, concept, realization, and challenges. Right, let's see, demand. Few words about, but an image, a thousand words. So days before our releases in the last seven years. You can see 20 days, 40 days, 60 days, 70 days, 100 days. Believe me, uh, the platform team doesn't spend a week in Hawaii in this time. We work very, very hard to do things. And I hope at the end of my presentation we will reach this kind of path. So, demand. Every release, we have 40, 60 days huge amount of things packed in the release, and it packs huge range of the platform part. And if something went wrong, what's happened? It is really hard to identify what's going wrong, especially outside the platform team. Somebody has no idea what's going on under the hood. Solution? Roll back. Roll back the previous version, previous major version sometimes. What this means? Uh, it can be months, weeks, months old. It can hold back new products, new implementation. It can cause pause everyone, and our life will be harder than necessary. And not outside the platform team, but inside the platform team, because our guys should put away the nice things and start drilling down what's going on, implement a fix, release the fix. It's painful. Concept. After the last conference, we decide and discuss and decide to change from large amount of release to a small, agile, agile, -like, agile sprint, agile train-like release. Which means, but that wasn't a new idea, we're talking about years ago. Which means, we release a point release every two or one or two weeks. Contents changes, defect fixings, and easy rollbacks. Because if we release a, a something, two weeks work, and it's wrong, you roll back two weeks work. And the next two weeks, one, two weeks, you can get a fix. You can step forward immediately. We decide to release minor release every three months and major release in every year if it's necessary. So if we can develop a huge amount of new things, we can release a major release. Okay, a couple of words, the release types. Point release, defect fixing, small changes, small things that trickled in somewhere and nobody see outside the, the platform, some refactoring work, minor small changes, new features, large works, and defect fixing, of course, 
and the major version, which is not fit in the previous two, or if it break the backward compatibility. Sometimes it happened. Sometimes it happened we did some changes based on the security stuff, so it's break the backward compatibility. So, realization. We introduced the X branches. X branches to collect things, and we have not one branch, we have a couple of branches, usually two or three branches, and we release stuff from the branches as well. Sometimes parallelly. Why? Because the older branch can contain the defect fixing, and same time at least the other branch can contain a feature, a new feature, a small feature. Okay, so push a button release. Previously, the release was mostly manual work. Reach out, collect the things, tax it, release it. We use Git, so it was a manual work, but now it's automatized. We have scripts for this, and the result is, if we want, if we have, we can release things a couple of day times, if, if it's really needed. Okay, challenges. Yes, every change has challenges. These challenges, we have a point release, a branch, which contains a couple of new stuff, but we keep it of only a couple of days a week to weeks time. And we should test it. We should test it because if it don't test, doesn't test it, it go out and roll back and headaches and other things. So, we should, every, uh, Every release candidate is daily basis and different size, different hardware. Why? Large and small. Small hardware means a four core machine, 60 gigabytes RAMs. Why? Because a lot of laptops has this hardware and all platform should run on a laptop because somebody developed our stuff on the laptop, somebody want to try our system on a laptop, so it should run on this. And of course, it should run large machine because the servers are large. And we should test different settings. For example, we should test different tor number of tor slaves and different number of channels of, or, of tor slaves. Okay. <coughs> The platform teams, we have two main test systems. <clears throat> One test system is a smoke test, which tests all pull requests, which created against our branches. And this new X branches doesn't impact the smoke test because the smoke test use different branches, base branches of the pull request, so it's not impact. But, the smoke test utilized the new GitHub feature, that's the draft pull request feature. The draft pull request feature is very good for uh, proof of concept stuff. So you can implement the code, push into GitHub, and create a draft pull request. Why this good? This good because this pull request can't merge into any branch. But the initial, pull rack, initial push will be tested in smoke test, and you can decide <coughs> the next push or next commit should be tested or not. You can decide it in a simple switch box. Can observe the teammates. Can overview, can review, can comment it, and you can move it, the standard pull request, and then it can be merged for the target branch. Smoke test. The other test system is the OBT. OBT is overnight build and test systems, which runs in the large servers. And previously, one and a half, two years ago, we tested one branch every day. That was 
the main branch 5.x, 6. something, or the master. Now, we should decide, we decided it should change. But this test session took three and a half, four hours. So we reviewed the test. Oops, test. Removed some internal unit tests, which took one and a half hours. And we can reduce, reduce the whole test session to one hour, one or two hours. That means we can test, we can run a couple of test sessions a day for us. And we need it. And OBT get a new uh, front end. We, we call it uh, sequencer. And that's the sequencer config. So this sequencer run four test sessions a day. And this, the candidate branches, which will be built from scratch, execute all internal tests, except a couple of long run, which executed only once a week. Execute the whole regression test suite on HTOR, TOR, and Roxy, and report the result. Okay, the result is we can run this whole test set twice a day on a small machine. A small laptop sized machine, we can run twice a day this whole set. Okay. We have a versioning system as well in OBT, which means we can set up different kind of things. For example, number of tour slaves, number of channels, and we can combine it. For example, a large hardware, large machine, we can run two pre-point releases. That time that was uh, 7.4 and 7.6x with four door settings in a single node machine. It's not a cluster, it's a single node machine. Three times four door, four channels per slave settings, three different branches, and the master every day. And we can repeat it on the same day it is, it, if it is needed. On a small hardware, we can run three periods and the master every day. Yeah, last year I had a presentation about the OBT and smoke test. If somebody interesting, I can provide slides. Okay, the last part of, so I started with an image, a diagram, and I would like to finish it, a diagram. So the major and minor releases in the last three and a half years. So, what we see. We can see that was a 6.0, which took one year, the life cycle. Then the 6.2, which will be much longer. 6.4, it's much, much longer. Why this problem? This problem because a huge amount of things put inside the, this branch, and if you should draw back, it was painful. <coughs> and here, we start implementing our new strategy. 7.0 is half a year. 7.2 is a four months, approximately. And the 7.4 is going down now, because we have 7.6, and we're thinking about the next one. So we can we implement it, this shorter and shorter release cycle for the branches. And some numbers. The numbers of both releases in the branches. If we see that 6.4 had a 21 gold releases, 21 point releases. The 7.0 has a 20 same number of releases in a very much shorter time. So that means we released stuff 
every week, every two weeks. And same 7.2 and 7.4 with this very short window, we have 10 gold releases inside this. That was my thank you for your attention. If you have questions, find me. Well, hello. I know it's fairly late in the day, so hopefully you'll manage to stay awake. You haven't got long to go now, so keep on going. Um, so I'm going to talk about the path to 8.0. What you might have gathered from Attila's talk is we don't actually know what the next version of the platform is going to be called. It might be 7.8, it might be 8.0. Whether we call it 8.0 really depends on what features go into it. If it's something that's really radical and changes how the platform's used and configured, a bit of a change of a mindset, then it'll be 8.0. If it's just more incremental improvements, then it'll be 7.8. So what I'm going to do over the next few minutes is outline some of the areas where, if it was going to be 8.0, what kind of changes would go in. So um, a bit like last year, it's grouped into four different areas. I'll kind of talk about what we've already done in the last two releases, and then also what you can look forward to coming up and which of those changes might be considered a major change. So I'm sure this was on the list last year, but it's become even more significant. One of the big changes is trying to make our cloud support better. It's not that you can't run the current system in the cloud. You can. We've got lots of systems running in the cloud. We've even got examples of it working in Docker or Kubernetes. But sometimes I think it feels like you've got a square peg and you're bashing it into a round hole and hoping it goes in. Um, so there are various changes we want to make to the platform to make it as smooth as possible to use in a cloud environment. Um, so what have we done already? Um, if you're going to a cloud environment, one of the things you want to do is to be able to start up instances, do some processing, and then shut them down again. So one of the changes is in Thor to have a look at how long does it actually take to start it up. Um, and Mark's done work to really get that down tight. So now, moving forwards, it should be able, a job comes in, you should be able to start up a Thor instance, run your job, and close it down pretty quickly afterwards. For the moment, it just means that the system starts up more quickly, but it's kind of one of the building blocks that we need in order to head for that um, cloud support. One of the things our current system really doesn't do well is that we store the topology for the whole system in a single file. So we say, right, your ESP is here, here are your Thor nodes, here are your uh, ECLCC nodes, this is where your Roxy is, and it's, it's all in one file. That really doesn't fit in very well with the idea of dynamic provisioning, because what do you do? Kubernetes needs to modify that file, and then it needs to tell all the components, oh, by the way, that's changed. Um, so that's one of the key things that we need to really work at to take that topology information out of that central file and put it somewhere else so that it's a lot more dynamic. Um, one of the things Richard did recently in 7.6 is to change the way that Roxy works in that respect. So now it is possible for Roxy nodes to come up, and as they come up, they register with a topology server, and then everyone else nodes, oh, another node has come up, and it can start using it. So that's, again, another building block on the way to making it a lot more dynamic. Um, and the last one on this list is 
Historically, we've included IP addresses in our configuration files, but if a machine goes down and another one comes up, the likelihood is that it doesn't have the same IP address. You need a different way. You need to use a name to refer to that resource. Otherwise, that all gets out of sync. Um, so those are changes that we've already made in the existing code. How about a new code? What can we look forward to? Um, one of our focus is to allow the system to run as containers. So um, having a Docker container for each component, so you'd start that and it would start a Roxy or an ECL server. And to make sure that the whole thing works well within Kubernetes so it can dynamically resource the system. Um, the first one on that list is to do with getting rid of the topology from the central file and having separate files for configuring the individual components so that they can be brought up and down easily. And we need to make sure that um, historically we've used the idea that the storage is attached to the compute nodes. Now in the cloud that is no longer true, so we need to make sure that we work very efficiently where the storage is not handled in that way and we can have more efficient ways to get at the data. So a second area that if a change happened might be worthy of a version eight is in the area of security. Um, if you have, in previous systems, if you haven't tightly firewalled your cluster to ensure that people outside the cluster can get to Dali, then we had a bit of a security hole. So we now have a way that Dali can check who is connecting to it and refuse connections from outside the cluster, which is closing down one of the uh, really important holes in the thing. Um, at the moment, users can have access to files or not, but if you've got access to a file, there's no control over how you use that file. So somebody needs it for their query, but then there's nothing to stop them writing their own query that pulls data out of it and tries to extract information. So uh, 7.6 introduces the idea of restricted files, which allow you to say, okay, only special people can access this file, and if someone else needs to access it, then it needs to come through signed code, which means you can write a specific interface which protects how that file is accessed. And then people who use that file can only go in through that well-defined interface. Um, the other change was part of the Spark integration that you need to make sure that extra external clients that are accessing our data files have got the rights to access those data files. So now uh, that goes through DA file serve and it uh, tokens are issued to ensure that you really do have rights to read that file before you're allowed to read it. Um, now on the next thing, both of those last two things are works in progress. Um, the restricted files is actually pretty close to ready, but there's a lot more work to do on the DA file serve. Eventually, I suspect all our file access will be going through that to make sure that no, no um, other processes running on that box or from outside can actually get to the data unless they've been properly authenticated. And for the security, we're definitely going down the road of um, using uh, PKI to ensure that all the different components in the system have been are known about and they can trust their relationship. So when, a, when somebody connects to ESP or DALI, they can check, are you actually a component that should be in this system or are you a rogue component that somebody is set running on this box or something like that. So the whole idea is to really make it very secure and especially as you go to a cloud environment, you can't control your network infrastructure quite as well. You kind of have to trust Amazon that they've got it right and aren't letting other things run on it. By putting these in place, we can make sure that when we do put systems onto the cloud, actually 
we can be sure that nobody can get at our data and eavesdrop on it. So those are probably the two areas which are most likely to cause us to say, okay, this is a big enough change that it's going to be 8.0. There are a couple of other changes which they might be big enough to do that, but they'll probably come up in a minor release anyway, but they'll be quite significant for usability. Um, so one is interoperability. We've already, uh, I don't know who went to James's talk on Spark where he demonstrated reading, um, writing files for, in HPCC from Spark. Um, and behind the scenes, we've been doing work to change the way that we access disk files to make it a lot more configurable um, with the ultimate aim is so that you'll be able to natively, from HPCC, read Parquet files or HTFS files and just get it so that other people can come along and say, oh, it would be really good if we supported this file format and then we have a mechanism for just plugging it in in one place and all the engines and all the other components support it. Um, the other area we're working on is productivity. We're always trying to make it actually easier to use the system and more productive. Um, Dan has done a breakout session on data patterns, and Gordon's been integrating that into ECL Watch so that you get your data file up, you can immediately begin to explore it and understand what the data is. That makes it much easier when you're trying to get a new data file to find out what's going on. And Shamza had a breakout on the work unit analysis tool, which is being able to take your work units that have run and then find out where the pain points are. Where did it spend time? Was it because your data files were skewed? Was it because the ECL isn't quite right and could be worked on? If you're trying to speed your query up, where should you focus your attention? So there's a first version of that in 7.6, but the plan is to continue to extend that. So there's going to be, I'm sure, further data patterns integration and more rules for that analysis tool. And it's interesting, as we look at work units to say, okay, this is slow, how could we have found it? Often we think, actually, the users couldn't have worked that out because not all the information is there. There was one piece of information which was missing, which if we'd have known that, then they could have worked it out. So as these rules are written, we're actually improving the statistics and metrics that are reported by the platform so that the rules can use them, but you can also use them as you look at your queries and you can say, oh, that took 10 minutes waiting for one of the other nodes. Why was that? Whereas at the moment, that information might not be there. And there are also plans to improve the total system monitoring, so uh, things like disk usage, CPU usage, and get it more tightly integrated into the platform. Um, so I think those are, so I'd expect security and cloud to be the two big areas which, when something significant happens there, that's going to be 8.0. In the meantime, you're definitely going to get these changes in upcoming releases, whether or not it's a major one. So, thank you. Very good. Getting very close to the end. Um, one comment there, Gavin, is um, for everyone there. If you know said we want to do S, slash hole slash security opportunities slash G. So there are no holes. These are all just security opportunities. We're going to make the better. Uh, outside of that, um, I want to get now uh, our last speaker of the day. Uh, there is that person that is behind a lot of the things that you see, but you don't know where they come from. Uh, things like the website, things like communications, uh, materials, graphical things strategies around uh, getting the platform out there, uh, getting uh, more traction in the community, uh, making uh, things that we do a lot more uh, visually appealing. Uh, I know I could go on and on and on, a ghostwriter behind the scenes and many other things. So I want to introduce here 
our last speaker of the day, Jessica Lorti, the legendary, the one. All right, I'm very cognizant that it's the end of the day and that I am following the platform team that everyone wants to hear from. And I'm the last person that you're going to see besides Flavio before you run home or get a cold beer. So I'll be fast. Um, this is our virtual ribbon cutting and uh, we actually have some scissors here. So these are the original scissors from Flavio. Um, uh, we have a new look. If you guys haven't seen it, please go out and take a look. This is a huge team effort. Um, we did some research. Several members of our community participated, and we are very thankful for that. Uh, we have improved data like messaging and focus. Um, that's a big thanks to Roger Dev and Arjuna Chala, uh, as well as the entire team, Lily also. Um, we have, I think, much clearer customer advantages. Uh, we've got a getting started section for newbies, which again, that's a big thanks um, to our training team. So Bob and Richard, that's huge. Um, our homepage, we elevated that. People said we had too much content there, so we elevated it and we, we made the about page more detailed. I just think it's more compelling and I hope that you find that too. Um, we've got new languages, simplified Chinese. Um, Yun, you have had your team uh, working on our Chinese for over a year. We thank you for that. Um, Lynn did, thank you, you did a massive amount of translation all by yourself. Um, Spanish, yes, uh, Joffrey, Rodrigo, wherever you are, uh, nights, weekends, really for all of you, thank you. Um, as well as Hugo, Brazilian Portuguese, thank you so much. This team really worked nights and weekends, not kidding, to do this. Um, we have a new overview video um, that I, I think is very good. It's been playing outside. If you haven't seen it, you can go take a look. It's on the website. Um, and, and as I said, very special call out to our design team. This is the Academy Awards section of the talk. But these people, every single one of them, this is not in their job scope. And every one of them has participated on this one and the one before. Uh, Stuart, thank you so much for allowing your team to work on this. You give so much. Of your, of your team's time, and we thank you. Um, Arjuna and, and Roger, I, as I said before, your fingerprints are all over this, and thank you so much for that. Um, Bob and Richard, you, you make us question, you help us get the right content. And Richard, devil's advocate over there, you, you challenge us to be better, and I thank you for that. Chris Lowe, he came up with the water flow diagram, uh, that was very inspired. We love that. So everyone, uh, shout out to Chris. Dan, you, you help us look at things from a different perspective. Flavio, of course. Uh, Jeremy is a wizard. Wherever you are, Jeremy. I think I saw you over here somewhere. Uh, you are a wizard every single day. And Sharon and I, thank you. Um, Jim, you're very thoughtful. You don't speak as often, but when you do, what you tell us is important. Lily, I've already said the ML information, thank you. Um, let's see, Sharon, over here, right-hand person to me and to Trish. That woman sat through every single one of our meetings and afterwards came back and reviewed everything with me and you know that woman probably needed a stiff drink after that. So, um, Stuart, as I said, you gave so much. Um, all right, and Trish, community, hello, awesome. Uh, and again, the translations team, uh, we do thank you. And every single person whose name has been up here, um, Flavio has something special for you. So if you could please stop by after the event and get with him. So that's it. It's almost time for the cold beer, but Trish, are you next? All right, come on up. Thank you, Jessica. Flavio, let's go. All right, it's closing out with a bang. It's pretty impressive. So if you haven't checked the website, we did a soft launch. So be sure to go to hpccsystems.com. Okay, so Flavio, what do you think? Community Day 2019. I think it was great. We pushed the bar higher, even higher today. Um, uh, it's gonna be a challenge next year to 
I don't step up that. and go beyond <laughs> that. But <laughs> we'll start preparing tomorrow. Yeah, after well, the beer. yeah, you know, I think not only will our attendees feel will leave here feeling more knowledgeable, but they'll feel more fit, more healthy, <laughs> and more inspired. Oh, I'm sure they will be. Yes, yes. And those in the live audience, I don't know how many of you could hold through it throughout the entire day. I'm sure there are a few there that uh, certainly have held, as well as the, as the uh, local audience here. So please, if you're still there, um, thank you very much. Uh, you've been uh, great. And if you are uh, looking at this, watching this video as recorded, uh, please um, go through the rest of the videos from today. Uh, there are plenty of good sessions, including the breakouts and, uh, and all of the plenary sessions that are really worth watching. Uh, yep. so. Yeah, and one last thanks to our sponsors for today. This day could not hap have happened. Uh, Dell Technologies, yes. Infosys, Datum Software, K-Force, and then a huge thank you to all of you, to our speakers, our poster participants, exhibitors for making this day happen. And just a reminder, all of the talks have been recorded and will be available for playback on our HPCC Systems YouTube channel. Big thanks to our AV team in the back. They've been scurrying all day, getting everybody wired up, so. Thanks to every one of you. This would have been possible without you here, so thank you. Thank, thank you, you for joining us. Safe travels home, and see you next time.